All right, so today is a Monday. It is the 4th of May, 2015. My name is Wayne McDonald. I'm the Chief FX Market Strategist for TradersWay.com. We do these sessions every single day, 7.30 in the morning, uh, here at Way.com, and every Friday at FXStreet.com, uh, which is pretty cool because this Friday is Trade Non-Fire Payrolls Live which is the most attended live web, uh, live event at fxstreet.com. And then apparently our regular uh, strategy sessions at fxstreet.com are also now the most popular uh, viewed and recorded sessions. So uh, thank you to everybody for your loyalty and, and all of that. Um, when this session's over, the first thing that I do um, is upload the recording to youtube.com c slash traders way in this way uh, if you miss a session or if I uh, say something that you would like to do um, it will be there um, it'll be there for you so if you watch those videos um, you know it takes about 90 minutes a day to do each of the videos um, leave a comment leave a like I mean a like takes less than one second I mean you could do that for me right um, but ideally, not just for me and others, but for yourself, um, you should leave a comment and at least document what you learned in the video and what you took away from it. Mucho gracias. So today, what, we, uh, what we're going to do is what we do every Monday, stick to our routine since it, it uh, leads to success, uh, is to review the event risks a week. There might be a risk, so they might be opportunities. Uh, maybe they're fundamental events that you want to take note of. But there is a lot of stuff going on uh, that is important to a foreign exchange trader. And we're also going to review the Commitment of Traders report. And that shows us uh, lots of things. Where large speculative investments are made by organizations like hedge funds, but more importantly, the change in those positions. And that is um, sort of our, um, our radar to find out what the big boys are, otherwise known as the smart money. And uh, usually we don't have enough time to do technical analysis, but if I can, we can review things. Like, for example, here's this USD CAD trade that uh, we lined up since this bottom retrace for the short, which it did. Then we talked about a potential retrace, which it did, 618, and is starting. So right right now, it's like three or four weeks of price action just moving beautifully. And look at this. We already have this week planned out, next week planned out, and the week after planned out. It's audacious, I know, but so far, so good. So let's just... Let's get the party started, eh, Brew? Now, let me remind you that trading and investing is risky and not appropriate for everyone. Your past performance, whether you were a hero or zero on Friday, is not indicative of today's result or tomorrow's results. So always stay small, stay humble, focus on the long term, and never risk money you cannot afford to lose. All right, so what do you guys want to cover first? Risk events or COT, Commitment of Traders Report? You tell me. You're the boss. I'm just a humble currency trader. All right, Fernando got it first. COT it is. Thank you, Fernando. All righty then. Okay, you know what? Let me get my drawing tool out. Sorry about that. Beep, beep. That this takes a few seconds. Just makes it easier to discuss things. Sure, what I'm talking about. Okay. Area, huh? Let's all go on vacation. 
We'll all rent a giant uh, villa on the Black Sea. All right. Okay, so what we're looking at here is the euro versus USD, the commitment of traders report, non-hedging, which means they're, they're in these positions with the intent of trying to make money. Okay, so how do, how do you come up with these numbers? Okay, these are large reportable positions. So I, I forget the number, 100 million or whatever it is. The positions are large enough that you're required to report them to the CFTC, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. So if you're a hedger, you're taxed differently than if you're not a hedger because a hedger needs to be in the market. So there's different rules, leverage things, and, and taxation rules. There's a lot of different things out there to, to you know, promote this idea that if you're a hedger, you need to report it. So anyways, so you got your hedgers. And that would be like uh, people that actually use the, the material. So if, if this was wheat, right, you, and you're a cereal company or a bread company, Need the wheat, so you're just using the, these futures markets to hedge your risk. Fine. So if you're a hedger, fine. And then, right, then you get these um, non hedgers, which are the speculative guys, right? And then you have um, smart money and dumb money and the small. The small traders, okay. So, you know, some would say the hedgers are the smart money, <laughs> right? The 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 hedge funds are the dumb money, and and then there's retail traders. But anyways, so um, so we 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 separate all of this. So this is just like hedge funds, fine. All right. So euro versus the USD. First thing I'm going to look at is this line up here. Okay, and more importantly, it's the recent trend and then within that what we want to look at is the um, the previous dot and the new dot because it might be dramatic change it might be hardly any change and we're looking for obviously something a little more dramatic and if uh, if you could see this let me see if I can if I zoom in it might mess things up Oh, perfect. That one's good. All right. That's better, right? That better say, muy bien. Okay. Trying to fit this in all nicely. All right. So you can see. week over week slight change to the downside so what is this yellowish orangish kind of line so you go down to the key now come on now well let's not do that come on okay and those are the shorts so what what does this tell us there are less people short this report versus last report is that important come on sorry I'm trying to get this it doesn't quite fit on our scale I think I'll just have to do this Okay. What it's what it says if Euro USD goes up and there's less sellers and no significant increase in buyers, are people actually buying the euro? Because remember, we're not just looking at price going up and down. That's what this red line is. That's price going up and down. We know that. 
But what we can do is separate those that are buying long positions and for those that are buying short positions. Okay, if you want to look at it that way, right? So this tells us that Euro USD for a couple of weeks now, for three weeks, has been generally speaking, or let's say technically, has been bullish, right? Up, up, up. Everybody agree? Say aye. Generally speaking, over the last several weeks, Euro USD has been up. However, nobody, according to this report, nobody has purchased any significant long positions. Look at the difference between these three weeks, right? Here, let me draw it. You have this versus this. Okay? Seems to be quite different, doesn't it? Okay? So nobody's buying, and yet there's been a reasonable downshift in, in short, right? So that's why it's been going up. Has more to do with people getting out of the shorts than actually going long. So has there been a change in trend? The fundamental trend has been down, 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 down. And this is what I've been saying has been my, my bias. Remember what I've been saying as price has been going up? Well, I know it's missing. The price is here, right? Anyways, um, your USD has been going up, and I've been saying, good, because then I can sell it higher. And what gives me this confidence? Well, we, we tend to watch this report, and to me, it still says things are fundamentally bearish. Let's see if I can just get some price in here before it shifts. Shoot, what is that? Still no price. Hang on. That's a mess. Doesn't really matter. Sorry, I'm just trying to fit this in so you can see it. There we go. Well, that's enough. All right, so anyways, that's what it's I've been telling us, okay? And the net short, there's just a little less people net short. And that's what the this net position is. And then, of course, the water line is zero. So the market is still very bearish on the euro. Cool. Next. Uh, all right. How about our pig? Who likes to trade the British pound? Yeah, I know Jenny does. Jenny, did you get your second chance on Friday? We talked about it, I think, on Thursday. And then the second chance? Very, very good, Jenny. You probably traded the double top, though, too. Huh? <laughs> you probably did both. <laughs> hey, look, you can do both if you're aggressive. Oh, so you waited... See, okay, cool. We'll, we'll see if we can revisit this, but um, we talked about the double top being Jenny was expecting the double top, but then we talked about the lower low retracement, lower high, which should give you approximately the same price you would have traded anyways, but because of the lower low, lower high, one, two, three reversal at the double top, at a place where you expected the double top, you're getting essentially the same trade with less risk. Same trade with less risk on the, on the long run is going to be better. So congratulations, Jenny, for catching that. you mind saying how many pips you're up? How's it doing? Or did you walk with 25 pips? Mm 
You got out with 130 pips? Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Better, ne better luck next time, Jenny. <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, let's look at the pig. And you can see there's a giant increase over the last few weeks. Okay, in price. This is the price. Oh, look, we got snow. It showed up. Sweet. All right. So you can see a big jump. Yeah, you know, this is a little bit delayed. Remember, this last price was Tuesday. So in this case, it's only up 500 pips. But, anyways, you can see. Generally speaking, a rise. And according to this, it's still people just exiting their shorts. Huh. Interesting. Um, I didn't expect to see that. I was hoping to see something uh, that showed us. Uh, wait, no, that's shorts. Uh, I'd like to see a jump in this number, okay? And there isn't. Hmm. I'm a little surprised by that. I, 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 I'm, I'm a tad bit bound because, as you know, we predicted the reversal in the middle of April. Cool. Um, so we got the reversal, did everything we expected it to. But according to this, the market has an awesome analysis. And remember, the market's always right. And I find my experience has taught me over 10 years of trading uh, um, publicly. Um, my experience has told me that the market is slow as molasses on a cold Georgia morning. But then when they figure it out, boom! So right now, our, our really intelligent mixture of technical and fundamental analysis and, and good old-fashioned guesswork did predict a reversal in British Pound. British Pound is up now close to a thousand pips and um, we don't see it yet in the Commitment of Traders report. Interesting, isn't it? What happens now if suddenly you get er, this one drops and er, this one drop, uh, rises significantly? Then that's ching, ching game on, bullish uh, trend in British pound. Yet we're ahead of the curve. Um, you can get into trouble though trying to outsmart it. So hopefully, sure, sure, Oscar. And how how to go, Oscar? See, what I've been saying is uh, I believe most governments are essentially impotent. Oh, yeah, I said that right. And um, right now, central banks are ruling the financial world, not fiscal policy. So on the long run or say in in the medium run short to medium run i don't think results are um right are are important i think i think you know i i think you'll get um uh, i don't even know if you'll get a short term shock and awe. i think they'll just it'll happen you know, obviously, there's a um, it's important somewhat and and interesting somewhat, and it's going to be all over the news globally. Fine, and you'll you'll have let's say for a day or so maybe a reaction, uh, probably not significantly drastically, right? And then all of a sudden we just go right back on to what we were doing before at the British town. Okay. Does most care about the UK elections? Probably not. Does most of the world care about the Bank of England's decision whether to raise or lower interest rates in the United Kingdom? <laughs> yes. So, pff, whatever. 
Right? So good luck with that. Hopefully there's a peaceful transition of power. That's all I have to say about Thaya. All right, Yen Yen, who likes to trade the Japanese Yen? Yeah? All right. Cool. Yeah, me too. Check this out. Pretty. Or actually, neutral. USD and JPY are neutral. It's the market's not net long. It's not net short. I'd be careful trading this pair because the market is neutral. I mean, quite literally flat. There's the same amount of longs as there are shorts. Which way is it going to go? <laughs> Well, be careful is all I'm saying because it may not go anywhere. Let's look at the last several months of trading. One, two, three, four, five, six, right? Seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, <laughs> right, 12. Uh, over 12 weeks, I think if you average it up, we're, it's worth about what? Buck 20, right? 120. Probably right there. If you, if you added up all of those and divided by 12, you'd get about 120. Okay. So please be careful. Okay. Please be careful. And that's it. I mean, um, stick to your bias, but don't expect much. So this is what we talked about, I don't know, last week, I guess, that you need to start to make a decision whether you indeed shoot at rabbits for the next several months or whether you keep setting traps for big game. Or maybe a combination. Let's say, let's say price comes back down to I don't know, nineteen fifty, one nineteen fifty. Okay, maybe your strategy. What I was suggesting is, you know, you need to decide: do you long it and and take fifty pips when it gets to one twenty, or do you long it hoping that it goes to one twenty five? And before it goes to 120, comes back down to 119.50 and knocks you out of break even. You had the fifth pips in your hand. So what do you do, right? Well, what if you took two shots? One, you say you're going to hold it till the end of the year. The other one, you're going to take your 50 pips and run. But now you got to double the risk at the entry. So... You know, at least think about how you're going to play it in a range-bound market. And let's say in the next several months, it's going to break the range, and you need to ask yourself, is it going to break to the upside or break and sort of lean more towards your bias? But right now, neutral. That's that. Go to Aussie. How do you feel about Aussie? Dramatic increase in right in price. Dramatic increase in price. Has there been a dramatic increase in long positions? Actually, just a slight tad less people long. Well, how could price go up dramatically if nobody bought it?
This is exactly why we do the Commitment of Traders Report. So what do you do with this information? Right, you sell at 80. Of course, we've already had that. But we've been talking about this for several weeks now, right? Look at the dramatic rise in price and the dramatic fall in those that are short. Less and less people, dramatically less people short. Uh, clearly, they're offsetting. Cool. So, are you a bull or a bear on the Aussie dollar based on the commitment to traders report? Not opinion. Based on this COT, should you be a bull or a bear? If I had this on an examination, what would you say? You should be a bear. Well, you shouldn't be based on the COT. That's what I'm trying to teach you. Orange is neutral range, not according to this. Dr okay, a dramatic change in short positions, no change in long positions, that creates price going up. It has a, 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 a direct impact on price. All right. Well, again, I didn't ask on if you were neutral. I'm asking based on this report. So if if you're not using you know if you don't take this information into account then you don't you should not look at the commitment of traders report that's all just based on this how should it impact your let's say your your overall bias you should still need to tell yourself this information is important and should be included in your bias that's all okay and according to this it's not neutral at all. Okay, you should be setting it up for cells. All right. Now, of course, you you got other information you can use, but like I said, just based on this. So again, if I gave you an examination, I said, look at a COT chart. Does it suggest bullish, bearish, or neutral? If you put neutral, I would probably mark you wrong. Now, of course, there's other known information, but if I just gave you that and said, explain this to me, you should say bearish. Because nobody's buying it, but people are definitely getting out of their shorts. So at some point, they're going to get back in their shorts. Nobody's interested in buying. So anyways, and then here we are, some Kiwi, little pullback in Kiwi. Okay, look at the shorts, guys. Down, 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 down. Wow. Then look over the recent period of time. Up, 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 up. Okay. Quite a few people have, have bought. Quite a few people have gotten out of their shorts. So at some point, what we want to see in price is this. Okay? Now, this is price now. Okay. A little all over the place, right? But, you know, maybe you play it like this. Look at the nets, guys. Look, just look at the net. Okay, anything below this line here is bearish. Means there's more bears than bulls. Look at look where we are versus the beginning of the year. There was, you know, a, a, it was fairly bearish. Now I'd say it's 
almost extremely bullish, isn't it? Sort of the this distance from how bearish it was to neutral is less than how bullish it is now. So we've had quite a change in sentiment. Remember, it's not even sentiment. It's changing in large reportable positions from clearly more bears. By bears, I mean people short. Okay? In this case, selling Kiwi dollar. In this case, now they're long Kiwi dollar. Because this, this Kiwi contract is priced in dollars. So they're, it's not really Kiwi dollar. They're actually buying the New Zealand dollar. They're net long Kiwi dollar. So that's quite a thing. That's quite a change in trend. So buying dips would probably be a reasonable strategy. Okay, and kitty cad. Look at this change here. We were consolidating for a long time, as you know, for the USD CAD, and down, 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 down. Cool. Market is trying to move back, more Canadian dollars. Okay. Still quite neutral. Look at small change in shorts, no change in longs. Amazing, huh? And that leaves us here. If I back up, there's the consolidation we had. You can see the technical analysis is quite basic. Breakout pullback, extension, retracement, hopefully extending to the downside again, retracement, extension, so on and so forth. I believe we, we have this predicted down here near 117 based on this first 382 retracement predicts the 1618 extension, which puts us right here, 117, right? So this top to this bottom to this top predicts this area here. And the rest, that would be the macro move now, right? The macro move is here, the big move. And there's going to be us inside these waves. And that's what we have these for. Okay? So imagine the macro wave, uh, imagine it just being a daily chart. And then the microwaves, imagine it on a one hour chart, for example. So if you're watching it on a daily chart, you're not even really going to see a lot of these things because um, this drop is probably just going to look like a bearish candle. And then the basement is probably just going to, let's say, let's say it comes up and comes down in one day. So it's probably just going to look like maybe a doji. And then, and then it's going to extend down. So the next one just looks like this. It doesn't look like it's to a day chart. But obviously, on an hour, you have the down, 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 up, up, dip, down, 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 down. Lots to do. Oh, interesting question. Eric wants to know do I know a strategy for gaps? I absolutely do. Would you like me to tell you? Okay. <laughs> sure. That's why I'm here. All right. So what happens uh, over the over the weekend is new information is added. So efficient market hypotheses, the EMA, suggests that price reflects all known information. And in Forex, the only time we're vulnerable to this is at a, there's two times really. Uh, a surprising news result, and that's why we're going to go over the event risks later. So, like, we have non-farm payrolls this week, right? What if it came out negative? 
So, you know, um, your USD probably looks like this. And then NFP comes out, and it comes out negative, and, it, and boom, it would just be over for the US dollar, right? Um, so that's one event. But sometimes over the weekend, we learn news. And so you could have, like, everything's good, and then we close here on Friday. And then on Saturday, when the markets close globally, um, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a, U a U.S. naval ship is bombed. We don't know what, but is it war? Is it terrorism? Whatever. And you could have a scenario like this: market opens here. Okay. Now it's unusual. That's dramatic, but what can happen over the week is, let's say, instead of a 500 pip gap, very often you can have something like, uh, it just opens down here, and you get a 30 pip gap, or a 20 pip gap, or sometimes 50, even 50 is dramatic, okay? And this creates an opportunity. Okay, so the dramatic one you got to be careful. Okay, because um, you know it, if it does impact your term, it's that gap's probably going to stay. Um, but we'll talk about that in a different time. Traditionally, the way I trade it is: let's say this pair, whatever I'm pretending this is, um, gaps down, opens here. They call it a gap because there is no price in between. It just, Monday opens down here. Okay? What I tend to look for is price to come back and fill the gap. And it's usually mostly all of it, but not always. And then, very typically, it continues its mission. Not always, but that's the theory, the general plan. So something over, over the weekend caused this currency pair to drop, okay? So it just drops. In fact, it doesn't actually drop. It just opens lower. So what you want to look for on the smaller time frame when you notice a big gap, and here's the gap where there's no price, there's nothing there, Typically, what I do is I, I drop into a smaller time frame, like a one minute or a five minute. It only happens on Mondays in, in Forex, big gaps like that. So you have price now like this, and then it gaps. So sometimes what it'll do is it'll come down a little bit more, and then it'll come around, and it'll start to rise again. Very often, once you're at or near, where price closed on Friday, you take your profit. So the first part of the gap strategy is take your profit here. Okay, you trade into the gap, and you take that much pips, which is approximately the, the width of the gap. Then the second part is whatever caused the gap in the first place, generally, and again, not all, but generally speaking, what I try, what I'm looking for, is for it to continue its mission back down. Okay, this has to do with profiting and rebalancing and, and, and getting into the right position and all that kind of stuff. As market participants come back to the market and adjust to the new news. Okay, so if you're going to try to profit off the gap, you would. Fill the gap, and then trade in the direction of the new trend. Okay? Now, another way to have this information, um, I'll, I'll tell you a story briefly. About six years ago, I was long, I think, I think it was long. I think it was long somewhere, and I forget what it was. But I was long like seven or eight 
positions. And uh, I felt good about it. I, you know, I just remember properly being in there, you know, good technicals. And I think I had like 50 pip stops, all of them. Okay. And I felt really good. And I can't remember if, if, if the stops were profit or break even or, 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 or what. But I, I think I was up like, let's say, basically 100 pips, 80 to 100 pips per trade. Stop loss and break even or something, but 50 pips away. And I felt good about the positions. I liked being in them. Technically, I think I got in good. I had stops on everything, and I liked fundamentally where I was going. Okay? So I felt really good. And then some sort of news occurred over the weekend. And again, I don't remember what it was, but it was important. And I'm like, oh, snap. That's awesome. Because I thought the news would help me. I wasn't worried about losing money because I had stops. And whatever. So I thought this could be very good for me. The market could jump like, 100 pips and I'm in like seven or eight trades. This could be really good for me, right? The problem is it gapped against me. And my stops were, like I said, about 50 pips away, I think. Locked in some small profit, right? Worst case scenario, theoretically, is I only make a little bit of money. Well, the problem was, let's say price was here. My stops were here, or my entry, let's say, was there. And let's say my stops were here, okay, something like that. So here's my stop, here's my entry, and here's price. So in this case, I, I could lose a little bit of money, right? Whatever, in this case. So price is up here, and if price comes down and hits my stop, I'm taken out, right? And I lose a little bit of money. But that's that's how it goes. The problem is it gapped more than that. It gapped something like 150 pips. Okay? And all of a sudden, it went from here to here. And we were now trading like this. Am I taken out of the position? For a small loss? No. So this is a pretty rare occurrence. It can happen. And the reason I'm not taking out is price didn't actually touch my stop. It's now simply below my stop. So my stop loss was above price. But I'm long. It's not slippage. It just didn't touch. That's how stops, you have touched your stop to get knocked out. But price gapped. It's very rare, guys. And this was probably like in the 2008 kind of time frame. I can't remember. Um, but it did happen to me. And suddenly I was super excited because I remember... I remember I was at my computer because I, I was thinking, man, I'm going to make like 2,000 pips and I want to take profit, right? And I, I'm waiting for the market to open, waiting for the market to open, and it opened and I almost had a heart attack. But I was there at the moment it opened because I thought it would do this, boom, and I, I'd be up here, right? And I, I'm in seven or eight trades. I'm just going to take my, you know, 3,000 pips and it was all going to be good. So anyway, so I was down here. And the reason I bring this up, this losing position for me, where I could have taken a bloodbath, what did I do? Did I panic? No. Why? Because I, I know how to trade gaps. And the, again, my theory with gaps is to uh, let it try to fill the gap. And then what's it going to do? Is there no hope for me for it to go up? No, it's going to do this. Um. And the second part of this is you got to be very careful because if it was very significant news that could change the trend in the market, it might not 
pull back very much and it could drop like a ton of bricks. There's no hope, right? Remember, it doesn't have to technically do anything. Fundamentally, the new information is going to drive price. So I was left in this situation where price had done this. My stop was about here and price is down here. I could, I could, I could panic and get out immediately, which is one way of doing it. At least I, you know, I'm not going to lose any more money. But what I decided to do is uh, stick with it. So I dropped down to a one minute and a five minute chart and I watched it do this. Okay. And then I got out. I still lost money, but it took me like a week to make it back. But I lost like 50% less money than I would have if I didn't know the gap strategy. Um, I decided, and I think, you know what, I think it ended up even going back farther and, you know, like this. But, you know, I, I don't care about that. I had an opportunity to get out with half as much loss because I was patient enough to wait. Okay? So, um, so two things do occur. It's usually uh, over the weekend based on new information. Two, significant gaps more than 50 pips are quite rare, but do occur. And three, when I was in a situation of duress, I relied on my knowledge of sort of probabilities, if you will, that price was probably going to come back um, and fill the gap unless the information was extreme. Uh, there's no reason it has to fill that gap at all. And I was, I was able to reduce my loss significantly just by paying attention. Remember, I didn't just walk away and guess. I dropped into a one minute and a five minute. And as long as it wasn't doing anything bearish, I stayed in it. <laughs> right? But any sign of bearishness on a, on a five minute chart, I'm like, out. You know? But I, I definitely reduced my loss. It was a big slot case. It wasn't sort of my fault. Right? Something dramatic and completely unexpected occurred. But I was able to stay calm and rational. And instead of taking a bloodbath, um, I just had a, a break-even week because throughout the rest of the week, I was able to make up my losses through small, conservative, repeatable trades. And I just sort of, it was a bad week, but I didn't lose any, any money kind of thing. And you just move on. So I don't even remember sort of the scenario of what the news was and all that stuff because it didn't have a large impact on my overall, you know, month or, or well, let, let's say month, but not year, right? So that's how you handle it. Okay. Was that helpful? And Oscar says, what if it's in line with the trend? Well, same thing. Um, very often, that's an opportunity for people to take profit and the, and the price collapses. Okay? So that's happened as well. And that's what I was ready for, guys, where I was up, you know, like I said, 80, maybe 100 pips on several trades, maybe 50 pips on some other trades. But the, the boat was loaded, so to speak. And I thought the news was going to gap in my favor, and I was, I was going to stay in it until the opposite, right? where I dropped into a one minute and five minute until it looks like it was starting to come back around to fill the gap, I was just going to take my money. Because look, if it gaps up 100 pips and you're in seven trades, all of a sudden you're like, yeah, baby, that's a, that's a good day. Okay? So I was ready to get out on the first sign of exhaustion. Um, and that's why I was there at that particular moment. So, you know, this, there's a lot of lessons in here if you think about it. One, I did my best to reduce my risk going into the weekend. Two, I was still trading over the weekend. Even though the markets were closed, I was paying attention to the news. And I was thinking about my positions over the weekend. And then three, you know, before the market even opened, I'm at my desks 
at my desk. The charts are open, and I'm ready to act. Right? And then four, I think I'm on, right? I stayed calm. My thoughts were collected. I stayed rational. I've been under extreme duress. And I used technical analysis to uh, reduce my risk and reduce my loss. Or in the, in the reverse scenario, if that had occurred, to maximize my win um, well, and, you know, and get out of the trade which is another way of reducing. So uh, there's a lot of lessons in there because you know a lot of amateur traders, they're, they're just not on the ball like that, right? They didn't even notice the gap. So uh, I need a 20-second break. Sorry. All right, thank you for that. Let's do the uh, calendar. Zeal, is, it, it is very difficult if there are too many open positions. Yeah, well, I've managed as, um, as many as 150 open positions at once. Let me set something around. All right, this is a full calendar. I can't even get it on here. Maybe I'll reduce it. Well, no, I guess we'll just leave it for now. Eric says binary still. No, you you don't. Yeah, you don't get 150 trades open. Many of them be long-term trades. Sorry, come on, sorry. All right, that'll have to do, pig. All right. Yeah, so yeah, when you're in longer term positions, think about this way. Um, let's say you have uh, one trade in the market and it's profitable, and your stop as is at break even. How much? margin do you have available for your next trade? What percentage? Hundred percent. Okay. Let's say you have one hundred trades open. They're all profitable. And all stops are at break even. What percentage of your margin is available? So how do you get 100 open positions? One at a time. Is that an eye-opener for anybody? 
It might take you three or four months. Yeah. But Nuno and Daniel, for example, they, those two guys that just sent, they know, they've seen them. They've seen the positions. Somebody asked me one time, and it might have even been Nuno, how many trades do you have open? And I'm like, well, let's just look. And I pulled my platform over. Yeah, 120. Oh. So anyways, um, let's get going. It's going to start here with the Southern Cross in Australia. Trade balance, fine. More importantly, all right, uh, interest rate decision. Very nice. On Cinco de Mayo. Yeah, yeah you know... Here's why I like sharing. Um, you don't know until you know. And it, and it that the knowledge itself, right? It's like Roger Bannister, um, the four minute mile. And it used to believe that it was physically impossible for the human to run a four minute mile. Now people do it all the time. You know, it, it's like only, if you only knew, then you would at least try, right? Or it just, it's, right? It, it, it opens or opens your mind. And so if you go back to last August, the, I preached one message very clearly, and that was to not take profit, to not try to make money, to simply uh, open good positions, let's say buy at support, move your stop to break even, and leave it. And the goal was to get as many trades to break even as possible. If they all get knocked out at zero, fine, don't worry about it. But it, if, they, if some of them suck, that you'd get paid, not in August, forget about it, don't even think about money in August, but you'll get paid in November and December. And if you're lucky, over the course of August and then later in September, a significant amount of your trades, let's say eight or nine or ten of these trades, will not be knocked out at break even. That was the, the focus for the entire month of August of 2014. And I'd have to double check the stats, but I, I think I made something like 20,000 pips in um, uh, September, October, November. And all I did was carry out that strategy we discussed. <clears throat> and I believe quite a few people did very well for themselves under the same idea. Can anybody confirm that message that they they were there? That's what we did for the for four weeks straight. That's all we talked about. Is anybody here? I think Nuno. I think Daniel. Uh, I think Debista. Who else do I see here? But yeah, is that Ranapana Popana? Yeah. Pjk Pjk is that? Uh, um, uh, the cruiser, I'm cruising. PJ cruiser, yeah, all right, yeah, cool, right on. It's good. Everyone has different names. <laughs> yeah, so awesome. I mean, awesome. So that's how you get positions at large, right? Just one trade at a time, but with intent. And we talk a lot about intent, right? With the intent. So, anyways, um, RBA decision. That's going to be Lufle tell you mum. Lots of Aussie trading lately, right? And we got to, to we got to eighty, 
So I'm wondering if that was it, if we go from 80 to 70. Current price is what, 78 and some change, 78 and a half, basically. And we were at 80, so maybe it started. So, uh, okay, keep watching. Seems like people are thinking are, are finally a cut to 2.0. Well, that would be bearish, wouldn't it? PMI out of UK, fine. Um, trade balance out of Canada and the United States. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Okay, yeah. Pay pay attention to this. Um, it's important, you know, to see what's going on in these economies. And in particular, I'm thinking more interesting Canada to see if um, if rebound in oil prices and, and commodities have positively impacted them. And then out of the U.S., it's almost the opposite. Um, the concern is the U.S. dollar is too strong, and, and that affects trade balance because U.S. products are more expensive. You know, I don't know. But it, I think a lot of that gets washed out because now the U.S. dollar is strong, so we can buy foreign goods for cheaper. And, uh, you know, yeah, I, I, I think this could create some volatility, which is good. But I think... I think it's going to get overshadowed by the rest of the week. But, you know, combination of you know, trade balance out of the two economies at the same time, and yeah, I, I think you'll get some scalps out of it, right? And then later, more importantly for the day, is uh, ISM manufacturing. Or, sorry, ISM non-manufacturing, which is ISM services. Now, we talked about using ISM non uh, uh ISM manufacturing as a way to see if they remember the story about the forklift driver at the warehouse if if he's driving a uh, Cadillac Escalade things are good right because he's got a job he feels comfortable in his job he's getting paid a reasonable wage um, there's credit available so on and so forth right it's trickle down economics well, in this case, now we're looking at non-manufacturing, which is ISM services, and it is a service economy. Uh, so we want to see a good number out of that, especially with a, after a bad GDP. Okay? And then what? Okay. Kiwi unemployment rate? All right. Well, if you're trading Kiwi, a good number is going to be good for your Kiwi, right? So, um, yeah. All right, fine. I mean, obviously, a good number would be good for New Zealand. A bad number would be bad for New Zealand. Fine. And then back to Australia. And, and if you don't know, if you confuse these two uh, flags, they look similar, right? You see the difference? There's a little star in Australia. That's the southern star. So that little star there, that means Australia. And you notice on New Zealand, they don't have one. Okay. Just a so quick glance. Australia, retail sales. Well, if they're cutting interest rates, are they going to have a good retail sales number? Probably not, right? On Wednesday, you got another prediction. Just before that, you're going to have PMI. I, I don't think the UK PMI is going to be that important this week. We've got things like, oh, I don't know, you know, the election. <laughs> so anyways, ADP tends to be a pretty good scalp. It's a pretty good scalp, guys. Another dumb prediction, ADP tends to produce a pretty reasonable scalp, especially if the number is dramatically good or dramatically bad. Yellen's going to speak. Yellen and screaming. Scream without a race in your voice. Right? So when Grandma Yellen speaks, the market listens. Out of Canada again, IV PMI. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. Don't really want a 47.9, do we? 
All right. One of my favorites is the Aussie Jobs Report. Hoo-ha! Uh, really, I like it. I like it a lot. Um, yeah, as you drop the report, make sure you trade it. Okay. So Eric says NFP is always volatile. What about the others? Well, that's what I'm trying to get across now. I'm picking and choosing. So the report, if you filter it, they say they're all important. Well, that's if you don't have a brain. So I'm trying to filter through this using a brain and experience of which ones are more important than others. Okay, so that's exactly what I'm trying to tell you. So Oscar says NFP is the most volatile. No, actually, it can be, uh, but I'll give you an example. Uh, I spoke on a at a conference many years ago in New York. It was um, Todd Gordon, Ashraf Lodi, myself, and some other dude that worked for a broker. I, I can't remember who it was. So it was like three guys that work for a broker and then my, myself and uh we at that time i remember one of the interesting things because i was i was doing my non-farm payrolls at fx street so i was already doing that um but uh ism services where is it ism non-net manufacturing was the most volatile okay well, FOMC isn't isn't monthly though, Nuno as well. Okay, so ISM Services was actually more volatile than NFP at that time, and right now I think ADP is the easier trade. And it's very similar to NFP. So you know. And I'm not sure if ADP and, and NFP are, you know, they're probably similar. But, um, but anyways, you, you, generally speaking, though, you're right. Oscar's right. And NFP is. But uh, there's lots of opportunities to make and lose money on this calendar this week. There's lots of great trading. Okay. So Aussie Jobs Report, love it. Okay. RBA Policy Statement, love it. Canadian jobs report, U.S. jobs report, right? Where's Kiwi? Kiwi jobs report, I mean, awesome, right? Throw in ADP is another jobs report. I mean, just those alone. Lufle to mum, right? I'm looking at this scalp, 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 scalp. Right? And then, of course, these scalps. Just those. But there's more than that going on this week. Oh, and don't forget, uh, um, starting off the week with the RBA statement, I just can't even fit it on the screen. Right? I mean, some really good trading this week. Fantastic. Oscar says uh, ADP might have changed their formula. I don't think so because the way I understood the formula was they just simply give you the number. Now, remember, ADP is a payroll processing firm. And all they're doing is saying how many people are on the payrolls. So I don't know what the formula would be besides how many people are on their payrolls. But maybe I got that wrong. Now, many years ago, um, you know, I had some research conducted. Uh, Worley did it. And uh, he looked at positive and negative correlation out of ADP in, 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 with the intent and purpose of predicting non-farm payrolls. And there was absolutely no correlation at that time. This was before the crisis. There was no positive or negative correlation. It just didn't have a, an impact any anyway to the non-farm payrolls number. And, and likely that's because ADP, I think, just calculates how many people are on the payrolls. 
Um, and the US government uses two different financial engineering fuzzy logic models to guess at, at, at NFP. So they're completely different methodologies, right? So they're not going to overlap. Now, however, we're in a world where the market is not controlled by supply and demand per se, but by government and central bank manipulation to artificially do things like artificially stimulate through low interest rates, um, create jobs, all this kind of stuff. So the correlation is extremely high now, but that's only because the Fed is creating the jobs, not the government. Right, the Fed's creating the jobs by manipulating things, right? And this has a direct impact, and therefore the correlation is going to be extremely high. Okay. So, whatever we'll 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 see where that goes. But this is going to be a good trading week, guys. I'm excited for you. And I'm going to be here every single day as well to help you be prepared and discuss what some of these numbers mean when they come out. So I'd like to thank you for being on my team. I'm sorry this uh, went on for almost an hour and a half. But uh, I care about you, babe. I want the best for you. So thank you for traders uh, to Traders Way. Thank you for being a client. Peace on earth. May the pips be with you. May your profits be above average. And uh, remember, I'm going to immediately upload this video to YouTube.com. Um, so please, while you wait, why don't you review the video from Friday, or sorry, on Thursday, because of um, NFP was Friday, or I mean, uh, FX Street was Friday. So go back on one of the other videos and leave a like, leave a comment, and let me know that you care. All right, and I'll see you tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day. Cheers.